gehad, dames en heren, goede avond. Namens het Instituut voor Joodse Studies van de Universiteit Antwerpen en namens het Universitair Centrum van de Nations Antwerpen, zit ik u van ganse harte welkom op deze avond die we organiseren in het kader van het Lutherjaar. Op 31 oktober 2017 is het 500 jaar geleden dat Martin Luther de fameuze 45 stellingen publiceerde. Dit gebeuren heeft voor Europa zeer veel invloed gehad. Dat was bijzonder ingrijpend. Daarom dat ik zelf besloot rond dit gebeuren vier studieavonden, gespreksavonden te organiseren. De eerste avond vond plaats op 12 oktober met een panelgesprek onder de grenzen aan de vrijheid van meningsuiting met de collega's Dick Wursten, Jan de Volder, Geert van Istendaal, Wilke van Leeuwen en Guido Marnef. De tweede avond is vanavond. De derde avond is op 23 november 2017, op de eerste reeds in Marginda, met een lezing over religie, media en propaganda met Andrew Pedigree en opnieuw Dick Wursten. En de vierde en laatste avond is voorzien op 14 december, deze herfst, deze winter. Leven en werk van Luther is dan de titel met de collega's Heinz Schilling en Guido Marnef. Due to our excellent relationship we have with the Institute of Jewish Studies at this university, we can organize this evening concerning the topic Luther and the Jews. We have two distinguished speakers this evening, Professor Dr. Thomas Kaufmann and Professor Dr. Theodore Dunkelgreen, and they will both introduced by Professor Dr. Vivian Niska, Director of the Institute of Jewish Studies. Vivian, please. Come. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to welcome you here. And Luc, thank you so much uh, for your welcome words and for announcing that I will introduce the speakers. I will, however, as we discussed now, only introduce one of the speakers after a few words of gratitude on my part to Uxia, uh, to Professor Luc Bartmann, to Barbara Seegaard, and to Jan Morens, the coordinator of the Institute of Jewish Studies, who uh, Luc, of course, for initiating this, uh, and Barbara and Jan for organizing this wonderfully. Thank you all uh, for coming. It is a great pleasure to see you so numerously here tonight. And as Luc just said before, uh, it is very special that people who have come here tonight come from very different perspectives and very different points of interest are drawing them to this place. And I am always very pleased now that I have uh, directed this institute for 17 years when people of different creeds, of different uh, backgrounds, different ages uh, are coming together uh, in a room. And uh, this is certainly uh, the case here tonight. So I'm very happy, happily welcoming you. Uh, it is in the tradition of our, as we rightfully said, wonderful cooperation over many years. You know, we will celebrate the 10th anniversary of our first uh, shared, uh, shared uh, activity 10 years ago, the uh, chair of Jewish-Christian relations. We did that uh, in the spring. And uh, as I often mention in that context, uh, we have never shied away from controversial topics and uh, this has proven to be very beneficial both uh, from the point of view of research but also for a general public that sometimes things could be uh, uh, said and discussed uh, in this context that uh, can rarely be done particularly in a crowd of uh, mixed uh, with belongings and uh, beliefs. Uh, so uh, tonight, uh, this is another one of those uh, evenings where indeed controversial issues will be uh, talked about, uh, and they will be talked about uh, in the in 
light of the wonderful privilege that we have of academic freedom and the academic pursuit uh, of truth, whatever we all understand uh, with uh, this world. So uh, with uh, this I want to introduce, uh, I will only introduce Dr. Theo Dunkelkoy, uh, whom I welcome here and want to express my gratitude and delight. Uh, we have been working together here for many years and uh, it is, this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for you as expert uh, in uh, all somewhat older Jewish uh, studies, but in so many other things among the uh, Antwerp 16th century uh, and in the context, but also not only of Jewish studies. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for accepting uh, to be here, and you will be also the one introducing uh, Professor Kaufmann. So, just a few words, Theo, about uh, you. Uh, Theo Dinkelgrün is historian and senior research associate at the University of Cambridge, an affiliated researcher at the Institute of Jewish Studies. So, he will give the response. Dr. Dunkelgrün focuses in his work on early modern and modern European intellectual history, the intersection of the history of the book and the history of biblical scholarship, and on intellectual encounters between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Theo, please uh, introduce our speaker of tonight now, and thank you so much for taking over. <coughs> Thank you so much, Vivian, for that warm welcome. It's a real pleasure uh, to be back in Antwerp. Terug in Antwerpen, the avond zal in het Engels verder gaan, maar ik wil nu ten eerste in mijn moedertaal al nogmaals van harte welkom heten. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a real pleasure and a privilege to welcome this evening's speaker. Um, there really only is one speaker this evening who I will introduce to you presently. I will uh, facilitate a conversation uh, uh, after he has um, spoken, and, and we will follow that with questions uh, from you. Um, but it is, yeah, it is a, a particular privilege and pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's speaker. Thomas Kaufmann is professor of ecclesiastical history at the Georg August Universität Göttingen and chairman of the German Society for Reformation History, the Verein für Reformationsgeschichte. Educated as a theologian and a church historian in Göttingen, he held positions at the Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich before returning to Göttingen in 2000, where he served, among others, as the dean of the Faculty of Theology. Among his numerous distinctions are the two honorary doctorates he was awarded in 2017 alone, and the year is not yet over. Um, he is among the most important scholars of the Protestant Reformations, and the Christianity in early modern Germany working today. And I think that on behalf of Uxia and as we can say that uh, it is a particular, we are particularly fortunate to have him speaking to us this evening, to have Professor Kaufmann this evening, Andrew Pettigree in a few weeks' time, and then Professor Schilling um, to, to complete the quartet of, uh, of evenings that we have. We really have celebrated and reflected um, not only on the quincentennial of the beginning of the Reformation. But really also, um, Antwerp has been given, will, will have been given a sense um, of the most, uh, kind of, the state of scholarship on, uh, on Luther, on Lutheranism, on some of the most important aspects of his nachlas and reception. Um, and it is particularly important also uh, just to, um, to reflect for a moment on the immediate uh, uh, occasion of this evening's lecture, which is um, the publication uh, of Professor Kaufmann's book, Luther's Jews. It appeared in German uh, a few years ago, Luther's Juden, and has now appeared in English. I hope there will be a Dutch translation. Um, but polyglot says you are, you, you, you don't need that. Um, the fact that the topic of the evening uh, has brought together such 
an incredibly large audience. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the largest audiences that Uxia and Ace events have ever had. Mm -hmm. That tells us quite a bit. It tells us about, um, certainly that this is a, a sensitive topic from a number of different perspectives. It tells us that we are at a particular moment in the reflection on the various ways in which Luther has been read um, and studied in the past century in particular. It tells us about a certain maturity in that approach and uh, the notion of the adult, actually the adult historical notion um, as opposed to an unreflected or two-dimensional or, or too ideologically or apologetically um, or emotionally ingrained approach is one of the striking aspects of our particular moment which doesn't really have anything to do with uh, perhaps rather random uh, decimal significance of quincentennial, but rather with our distance of a certain um, uh, moment in the mid-20th century in two different ways of, of, of reading and interpreting and studying Luther, um, in particular, in particular his, uh, his Jewish writings. And it tells us that, um, that this is a particularly opportune moment to look at uh, advances in not only the history of Luther Forschung, of which Professor Kaufmann is such an important part, but also in early modern Jewish history, early modern, the history of early modern Jewish Christian relations. And as a, before, as, a, as a previous holder of the visiting chair of Jewish and Christian relations at this university, which was a position, is a position which, as Vivian told us, will be celebrated its um, uh, stenium in, in, in February. Um, I think it's in particular important to reflect for a moment that the publication of this book is also, among many other things, uh, a landmark in the study of Jewish-Christian relations. So without further ado, it is really my, my pleasure um, and good fortune to ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Professor Thomas Kaufmann, who will speak to us this evening on Luther's Jews. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, the warm introduction, and of course your interest. Ladies and gentlemen, I should like to, uh, to address two issues in the next 45 minutes. Firstly, Martin Luther's attitude towards the Jews, set in the context of the mentalities and attitudes of the 16th century. And secondly, the later reception and understanding of his views in the 19th and 20th centuries. I will begin by making a number of general points. To start with, none of Luther's writings dealing with the question of Judaism and the Jews were addressed to any of his Jewish contemporaries. When dealing with this topic, Luther confined himself to communication with other Christians about the Jews and never with the Jews themselves. Indeed, we have no indication that Luther ever sought out Jewish thinkers. Although the Jews were not expelled from Eisleben, the town of Luther's birth, until after his death, indeed he undertook his last journey to uh, this town to petition the authorities to do so, Luther's entire experience was characterized by the absence of Jews, a group with which he had little to, uh, little to no direct contact. Whilst Eisenach, the town of Luther's later schooling, recorded Jews' trading rights in 1510, it did not allow their residence. All traces of Jewish life in Mansfeld, Luther's home from the age of two, had been irradiated in 1434. The Jews had been expelled from Magdeburg in 1493, some years before the young Luther's arrival at the local school, and from Erfurt, the university he visited, in 1453 to 1454. There is no evidence of the presence of any Jews in Wittenberg 
between the late medieval period and the Reformation. Luther did receive a deputation of three rabbis in Wittenberg in 1525 or 1526. The episode was deeply disturbing to Luther and confirmed him in his belief that Jews not only denied but actively revealed Christ. It remained the only personal contact he, had, he was to have with those of the Jewish faith. Encouraged by the fears of those in his entourage, such as his wife, who believed in dark practices directed against his person, Luther became convinced that the Jews desired his death. His only colleague, Vergioli, well disposed to the Jews, was Justus Jonas, who retained Luther's early hopes of the impending conversion of the Jews as a precondition of the parousia of Christ as uh, late as the 1540s. The overwhelming weight of evidence would point to a general anti-Jewish consensus amongst the Wittenberg circle, shared and propounded above all by Melanchthon, who was the most active in disseminating Luther's notorious anti-Jewish tract on the Jews and their lies. <laughs> when addressing the Jewish question, Luther was moved by exegetic rather than missionary concerns, even if some of his earlier writings were cast in the guise of a dialogue with Jews. The hope expressed to the baptized Jew Bernhard that many of the Jews would be converted in earnest or drawn completely to Christ was indicative more of Luther's apocalyptic euphoria of the early 1520s than missionary concern. No 16th century popular author campaigned more insistently that the early Martin Luther, than the early Martin Luther for tolerance of the Jews, writing that, quote, we must receive them cordially and permit them to trade and work with us, that they might have occasion and opportunity to associate with us, hear our Christian teaching and witness our Christian life. Such sentiments would have moved many in the 1520s to view the author of the script that Jesus would have born you, uh, a born Jew as a friend to the Jews and an ally of the Hebraist Johannes Reuchlin. Although rejecting Reuchlin's legal arguments for Jewish tolerance and his general interest in the Kabbalah, Luther certainly shared a number of positions <coughs> with a Stuttgart humanist. Hearing of a number of rumors about his teachings circulating at the Nuremberg Reichstag, Luther found them so extreme as to be laughable and saw no need to respond. Nevertheless, concerned at their potential for inflicting political damage, the Saxon electoral administration demanded that their star theologian put the record straight. Charged with Christological heresy, denying the perpetual virginity of Mary and advancing the natural conception of Jesus Christ, Luther responded with the essay that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, published in 1523. His defense against accusations that he rejected the real presence of the Eucharist was delivered in the treatise The Adoration of the Sacrament from the same year. The literary form assumed by both tracts were conditioned by Luther's direct connections to individual groups. In the case of the Jewish text, it was provided by his contacts with the former Rabbi Jakob Gimfer, who had assumed the Christian name Bernhard. In the introduction, Luther referred 
to a conversation with a pious baptized Jew who told him that if a baptized Jew, quote, did not hear of the gospel, they would remain a Jew under the cloak of Christianity. The accusation itself probably related to a complicated passage of Luther's exegesis of the Magnificat, in which he was thought to have read the term seed exclusively in the context of Christ's human nature. Writing of Christ as Joseph's seed and allegorizing the promise of Abraham's seed, it was seen that Luther had made Jesus' conception the result of a conventional human reproduction and not the intercession of the Holy Spirit. Seeking to put the matter right, Luther outlined that the promise made to Abraham incorporated the prophecy of Christ's salvation as the outworking of Abraham's seed. As for the Jews, their failure to comprehend the full meaning of this promise meant that they, quote, closed the doors themselves that the seed, that is Christ, passed and thus remain. Let us hope that God shortens this time. Amen. After dwelling on the meaning of the Magnificat, Luther decided that the promise to Abraham's lineage, the Jews, remained in force until the day of the judgment. This meant that Christians were called upon, quote, not to act in so unfriendly a fashion towards the Jews, then there are future Christians among them. Viewing the case of the converted Jacob Bernard in the context of his Reformation project, Luther argued that his own theological innovations opened the door, so long held shut by papal theology, for Jews to come to faith in Christ. Dedicating the Latin edition of the essay on the Jews to Bernhard, Luther sought to demonstrate that his Reformation was the best and only ve vehicle with which to achieve the conversion of the Jews, and thus also a proof of the, the truth of Reformation claims. The centuries old, the centuries old Catholic anti-Semitism, ritual murder, and other stock charges, was only more than was nothing more than lies, and not to be given any credit. Instead. The Christian should, should seek to cultivate, clothe the context with the Jews in an attempt to demonstrate the reality of Jesus' love. Catholic compulsion was to be replaced by attracting the Jews to the light. <coughs> Luther did not write what he wanted to draw, Luther did not write that he wanted to draw Jews to baptism. He wanted to make them real Christians, rather than enabling them to remain Jews under the cloak of Christianity. This raised the stakes in Christian theological relations with the Jews, while the Catholic had long failed to achieve any progress, Luther wanted to use the new age, which had just drawn to bring about the long heralded but unrealized conversion of Israel. As such, Luther's tract 1523, Luther's 1523 tract represents a new development in the Christian attitude to Judaism <coughs> and was perceived as such by contemporary observers. Luther's idea woke hopes in both himself and others, his own grave disappointment at the Jews perceived un, at the Jews perceived unresponsiveness goes a long way to explaining his own later anti-Semitism. The situation was compounded by the need of the political authorities to develop a coherent policy towards the Jews 
in their respective territories. It was no longer possible to point to the failures and evils of the papists and their agents. The evangelical movement was forced to find an explanation for the apparent reticence of the Jews and its own missionary failure. Thus the contention of Jewish obduracy. Writing an open letter to Joseph von Rosan, a prominent Jewish spokesman who was sought an ally, who had sought an ally in Luther in his attempts to achieve right of passage through Saxony for Jews, Luther now believed that his early hopes had been exaggerated and the Jews had mistaken his calls on Christians to extend the hands of friendship towards the Jews as Christian acceptance of their position. Having abandoned his early hopes of widespread Jewish conversion, he blamed the Jews for their own obduracy. This explains the subsequent shift in his public position. The first published indication of Luther's changed attitude came in the tract from 1538 against the Sabbatarians' letter to a good friend. It purports to be an answer to a letter from an unspecified correspondent, the eponymous good friend, who relates the supposed Judaizing <coughs> mission undertaken by Jewish communities in Bohemia amongst the majority Christian population. Taking advantage of their newfound freedoms, the correspondent relates that the Jews reacted not with gratitude nor an interest in the new Christian theology, but with a campaign of proselytization, infiltrating the Anabaptist Sabbatarians in Moravia in an attempt to return Christians to observance of the Mosaic law. These Jews were said to have persuaded many Christians that Jesus was not the Messiah who was still to return. In the meantime, they were required to have themselves circumcised and return to the synagogue. In view of this, Luther welcomed the move made in Saxony from 1560, uh, 1536 to restrict Jewish freedoms. These claims remain doubtful. We learn nothing of the character of the Sabbatarians about whom this text was ostensibly about. His claim that they practiced circumcision is contradicted by one of Luther's pronouncements on the subject recorded in the Table Talks. Moreover, we have no evidence that the grouping led by the Kiliast Oswald Gleit maintained any direct contacts with Jews. There is no evidence that Luther really composed in 1538 <coughs> in response to Jewish involvement with the Sabbatarians, a grouping he had first been introduced to in 1532 though uh, through the words of the spiritualist Kaspar Schwenkfeld. The most plausible explanation for the composition uh, of what amounts as a theoretical tract was the desire to demonstrate that the true Messiah had come to the Jews some 1500 years previously in Christ and that not only had the Jews rejected him, but that the Mosaic law was no longer enforced. Luther's eponymous good friend bears an uncanny resemblance to the unnamed recipient of Martin Butzer's anti-Jewish tract written, written in the same year, and one of Johannes Reuchlin's as well, which also outlined the range of Jewish misdeeds. As such, 
it would seem that the author used an identical literary device to marshal all the arguments they could find and accusations of Jewish proselytization were the most serious allegations they could make. To head off moves in any of the Protestant territories towards Jewish relief. The origins and publication of the most notorious of Luther's anti-Jewish treatises on the Jews and their allies remain somewhat uncertain. The book which Luther mentions in the 76,000 word treatment as marking the reason for his taking up the pen once more is generally taken to be a volume presented to him by the Count of Schlick on, 80, on, on May the 18th, 1541 and containing criticism expressed by Rabbini ex Judeorum, rabbis from Judaism, against Luther's exegetic, exegetic arguments and claims of Jewish proselytization made in, against the Sabbatarians. The table talk indicates the existence of another tract from a rabbi sent to Luther in criticism of his exegetic arguments and culminating in an attack on his claims of Jewish missionary activity and the practice of seducing Christians to undergo circumcision. Despite the initial similarity of these two tracts, they cannot be taken as identical as the second text consisted of a dialogue between a Christian and a Jew in which the latter twisted several Bible verses in rejection of Christian teaching. In the absence of any good Christian reply, the debate was taken as having been won by the Jew. I believe this dialogue to be a colloquium published by the Basel Hebraist Sebastian Münster in August 1539 under the title Messias Christianorum et Judeorum Hebraike et Latine. <coughs> My belief is supported by a statement by Luther from the Table Talk from winter 1542 to winter 1543, the same period in which on the, Jews, on the Jews and their life was published. This passage records Luther's criticism of Sebastian Münster's translation of the Old Testament for concentrating too much on the theological details of the text and ignoring its theological message, a charge he leveled against both Münster and the Jews. Luther is recorded as saying, quote, Oh, the Hebrews, even those of ours are very Jewish. This is what I meant in Eolo Bello in this uh, booklet, Quem Scripsi Contra Judeus, which I uh, have written against the Jews. For Luther, a translation should concentrate not on the words, but the meaning something which he found both Hebraists, such as Münster, and the Jews singularly failed to understand. As such, I am left in no doubt that in writing on the Jews and their lies, Luther sought to criticize not only the Jews, but those Christian Hebraists <coughs> who ignored or suppressed the Christological verities of the Old Testament. Reading Münster's dialogue, I am struck by the range and texture of arguments which the rabbi makes against the fulfillment of the Old Testament messiah prophecies in Christ. The weight of reasoning placed on the Jewish side of the discussion raises the question as how far Münster still supported the Christian interpretation of the Old Testament. Articulating the core arguments of a wide range of extra-biblical Jewish 
messianic writings, Münster gave the Jewish side of the debate a latitude which Luther found simply shocking. The theological rebuttal, as issued in On the Jews and their Lies, was aimed as much at Münster as the Jews and was a defense of a Christian reading of the Old Testament involving fundamentals of Christian theology which far predated Luther's Reformation discoveries. The clear occasion for what amounts to Luther's most vituperative anti-Jewish tract was the political debate surrounding policy towards the Jews in which he wished to make a contribution. Saxony had established a restricted right of passage through its territory for Jews in 1539. The expulsion of the Jews from Bohemia crown lands in 1541-1542 most probably increased the numbers of Jews traveling through neighboring Saxony. This explains the reversal of policy in 1543, when Jewish right of movement in Saxony was curtailed with a clear reference to Luther's tract. Since the decision was enforced in early 1543, after the public, uh, publication of On the Jews and Their Lies, it is likely that Luther sought to and succeed in influencing poetry in this way. <coughs> the level of export expanded by Melanchthon and Spalatin to achieve the widest possible dissemination of this treatise indicates an attempt to achieve Protestant unity in policy <coughs> towards the Jews. Moreover, the level of evangelical <coughs> attention now accorded to the treatment of the Jews was itself probably conditioned by a rash of Catholic publications blaming the Reformation for encouraging Jewish misdeeds through a more liberal approach. As such, Luther represented but one voice in the wider Protestant anti-Semitic We should be cautious in overestimating the actual influence which he exerted on the debate. On the Jews advocated the destruction of the basis of Jewish life in German states, mobilizing any and every anti-Semitic <coughs> argument and story available to him, Luther displayed no shame in tapping long-held prejudices to reach his goal. Twenty years after having criticized Christians for following the Pope into treating Jews as, quote, dogs and not men, <clears throat> Luther now called on the authorities to expel the Jews, quote, as if they were rabbit dogs. Luther changed views, noted especially by Jewish contemporaries. Luther's changed views, noted especially by Jewish contemporaries, were the radical and conscious rethinking of his political position. Whereas his earlier approach sought to extend the hand of friendship to the Jews in the hope that they would convert, their refusal to do so made it imperative to remove a group whose beliefs rested on the active denial of Christ <coughs> and who posed an active danger to all Christian life. <coughs> they should be expelled to non-Christian regions to live with the Turks or other heathens. In view of this conviction, the actual catalog of measures which he advocated in On the Jews, characterized as harsh mercy, represented a concession to the authorities who wished to retain the Jews out of economic self-interest. Both Luther 
and a theological commission set up under the chairmanship of Butze to advise the Hess authorities on the matter, <coughs> one was to expel the Jews, but neither <coughs> countenanced their physical destruction. <coughs> This radical revision of Luther's earlier position masked a number of theological continuities. At no point in his career did Luther ever entertain the notion that the Jewish understanding of the Old Testament was in any way true. Luther never wavered from this view that the refusal of the Jews to accept that the Christological significance of the Old Testament prophecies was a serious and culpable error. Indeed, Luther argued that the whole history of Israel after the crucifixion amounted to God's punishment of an errant people for their rejection of Christ. <clears throat> Luther's changing attitude towards the Jews over 20 years was underpinned by a single unchanged concern, that of their attitude towards Christ. Remaining critical to the Talmud, the Exegetica and indeed all Jewish writings, he viewed Judaism as the religion of self-aggrandizement uh, and self-righteousness, diametrically opposed to the Reformation teaching on justification. The apparently liberal Luther of 1523 also rejected Jewish genealogi gene genealogical pride in their status as the descendants of Abraham and was skeptical of the practice of a nominal baptism pursued for the worldly advantages which it conferred. In wanting the Jews to convert, not just to assimilate, Luther radicalized previous church position vis-a-vis -vis the Jews. Theologically, therefore, Luther did not change his position. Nevertheless, as 20 years of Reformation preaching had failed to bring any progress in the mission to the Jews and no longer able to blame the Catholic Church, he was forced to adapt a different approach to Jewish renitence. Confronted by renewed Jewish self-confidence and taunted by his Catholic enemies, he adopted a less tolerant political approach. His political position may have altered, but his theological, but his theology remained unchanged. Luther's initial expectation that the restoration of true theology would eventually appeal to the Jews had proven to be a, person, a personal failure and he held he would be held to account on the Day of Judgment for this foolish attempt to argue for Jewish toleration in 1523. The later Luther interpreted the suffering of Jews as God's continued wrath over the people and a precursor of the impending wrath, which would be uh, wrong on false Christians and heathens alike. <laughs> In rejecting Christ, the Jews lived as a perpetual symbol of the folly of so doing and an example to the nations. Coming to this fresh perspective, he decided it should be publicized in text form so as to ensure that Jews would no longer be tolerated in Protestant lands. <coughs> so much for the 16th century. I should now like to turn to the afterlife of Luther's thought and its reception. The Lutheran orthodoxy of the late 16th and 17th centuries preferred the teaching of the late Luther in terms of his attitude towards the Jews. The pietism and enlightenment of 18th centuries rejected his anti-Semitism by playing off the young Luther against the old. With their focus on the importance and necessity 
of repentance, the pietists found much to agree with a 1523 call for tolerance and mission. The missionary interest of pious 19th century Protestants also inoculated them against the evolving biologistic racism of the 19th century. Those <coughs> seeking to convert Jews can believe that they hold the wrong faith, but will never believe in their genetic inferiority. In 19th century, the 19th century did not forget Luther's anti-Semitic writings and a number of the anthologies of his work published <coughs> during this time reproduce his most notorious statements. We must wait until the early 1880s, however, before we find dedicated anti-Semitic Luther digests. On the Jews and their lies and the list of anti-Jewish measures to be taken make up the core of such collections. <clears throat> the rebirth of Martin Luther as a folkish biologistic racist came in an undated pamphlet, probably published in 1882 or the Luther Jubilee in 1883. The 16-page anonymous pamphlet, the author's name is given as Islebiensis, the town in which Luther was born and died, with the title Dr. Martin Luther, Luther and Judaism, was published in the anti-Semitic William Berg Press and sported an intentionally adulterated quotation from Luther on the title page attributed to on the, Luther, on the Jews and their lies. The same misquotation was reproduced in later publications such as Theodor Fritsch's 1887-1887 anonymous publication of a catechism for anti-Semites attributed here to the table talk and later in a further changed form in a verbatim reproduction of a discussion between Adolf Hitler and the author Dietrich Eckart. In all three publications, Luther was misrepresented uh, as writing, quote, the Jew is not a German, but a deceiver, not a foreigner, but an imposer, not a citizen, but a strangler. In this way, the Eislebener sought to reclaim Luther as, quote, first anti-Semite, a man engaged in a struggle against, quote, a race not equal to that of the Aryans, and a Christian role model fighting against the debauching vampire Judaism. Confining his attention to Luther's later Jewish writings, of the unknownable name and the generations of Christ and on the Jews and their lies, the unknown author quotes long passages from 1543. Ignoring Luther's exegesis of the Old Testament, he also masked Luther's transition from a more open position towards the Jews to direct anti-Semitism. The Luther which he presented to his readers was a convinced and unwavering anti-Semite. The gloss on Luther's utterances set them in a modern context, providing statistical information, for instance, high criminality rates among Jews, and a modern commentary to show how, Lo how Luther's views not only retained contemporary relevance, but were in fact highly <coughs> prescient. An important point of the Eislebener was that the Luther of, of the unknowable name distanced himself from any thought of mission to the Jews. It quoted Luther's polemic against the befuddled humanist progressives, for instance, the 19th century missionaries of the Jews, Adolf Stoecker and Delevoye, 
who still did not want to accept that the Jews was racially incapable of conversion and was only interested in baptism in order to defuse or at least ameliorate righteous persecution. Musing on what Luther wanted to do in the late 19th century, the Eisleibner came to the conclusion he would rail against our Jewish rhythm judiciary, our particularly, uh, particularly Judaized uh, aristocracy, and against us dilatory Germans who were mistaken enough to grant Jews so many rights in the first place. Mining Luther's on the Jews for any quotable material pointing to the Jews as arrogant liars, usurers, Decides and demons, the anonymous author omitted passages in which Luther wrote of Jewish expectations of impending messianic rule, thereby making Luther the prophet of the Jewish world domination, which the Eisleibner believed was an imminent threat. The pamphlet is clearly an, appe an appeal for political action. The list of measures which Luther advised, burning Jewish houses and synagogues and setting them to work, was quoted in isolation from their <coughs> theological underpinnings and religious motives, especially those passages indicating the complicity of Christians in the various Jewish iniquities. iniquities. That this list of measures has been shortened and the prompting to the worthy authorities played up with an injunction, away with them always, printed in bold. The anonymous author sought to emphasize the urgency of the situation, stating that should the authorities fail to act, then, quote, the working class would act to free themselves of the Jewish yoke. Quoted some two years after a synagogue in Neustadtin has been burned to the ground, Luther's voice was now being put to the services of 19th century anti-Semitism. It is perhaps no coincidence that Luther's demand as maiden on the Jews had been published in any anti-Semitic newspaper, uh, has been published in an anti-Semitic newspaper published in the region some months before um, the arsonists set to work. Luther's treatise had become the tool of murders and their cheerleaders some 50 years later, some 50 years before Reichskristallnacht. <coughs> the text analysis of the central quotations in Theodor Fritsch, the anti-Semitic catechism, indicates that they were directly taken from the work by the anonymous Eisleben. It also advanced for further quotations, two of which were drawn from the table talk and two further fabrications. Concerning Luther's description of the Jews as irredeemable satanic, dedicated to a perfidious struggle to enslave the Christians and impossible to convert, the anti-Semitic or the anti-Semites catechism underwent a number of revisions, a five-fold expansion, and was eventually circulated as the handbook of the Jewish question, of which over 30, 300,000 copies were sold. The author sought to provide his readers with quote, a summary of all important records for anti-Jewish propaganda for educational purposes. Although appreciating the religious origins of much anti-Semitism, Fritsch informed his reader that the Jewish question, as he understood it, was a racial rather than a religious problem. A range of statistical material was developed, but it was deployed to outline uh, um, the exceptional geographical spread of Jews throughout the world and their extensive property holdings. 
which also cited a range of criminal statistics and recorded the number of Jewish professors in German universities, all marshaled in a fashion designed to spread fear of a prevalent and sinister Jewish menace. The Catechism also included a range of anti-Semitic quotations from famous men intended to demonstrate the long intellectual pedigree of anti-Semitism and established the Jews as criminals and lowlifes. Martin Luther received his own section. His contribution to this debate was highlighted by Fritsch as the largest set of quotations provided by any of the greatest thinkers, writers and statesmen. This approach, this approach was retained in all later editions and versions <coughs> of the publication. Martin Luther soon advanced to become the anti-Semitic totem <coughs> of the spiritual and intellectual authority and respectability. Publishing a revised and expanded edition of the handbook in 1931, Fritsch made no changes to the passages concentrating on Luther until the 49th edition. The new edition reduced the prominence according to, according to Luther and his name was no longer highlighted in bold. Instead, he was quoted in company with Johannes Eck to ensure a confessional balanced approach to anti-Semitism, something reflecting wider changes in nationalist circles. Referencing this study by Alfred Falk from 1921, Fritsch noted that, quote, the young Luther remained respectful in his utterances about the Jews, 1523, in a time which he had no contact with them. He advised Christians to be friendly towards Jews, as Jesus Christ had himself been born a Jew. He later corrected this double mistake and changed his attitude on the basis of subsequent experience. Fritsch indicated that Luther had changed his mind not only about the invisible treatment of all Jews, but also Jesus' status as a Jew. <coughs> this marked the end of clumsy attempts to manipulate Luther's writing and a more self-assured move to present his writings from 1543 as reflecting the honest opinions of a great man, <laughs> issuing a, a quote, devastating judgment of this rejected and God-cursed people. In later editions of the handbook, Luther advanced to become the figurehead of Germanic Christianity and a thoroughgoing eliminationist anti-Semite. The oft-repeated reproach made by racist writers that the Lutheran Church suppressed the, through, the true nature of Luther's anti-Semitism was a canard. A bulgarized version of On the Jews and Their Lies was published in 1931 by an official church press and was subject to many reprints. Writing in the introduction, the editor, Georg Buchwald, a retired church superintendent in Saxony, characterized Luther as reading the Jewish propaganda contained in the volume given to him by von Schlick and being moved to issue a defense against it. Quote, again, he was outraged by the Jewish depiction of the Messiah. The image of Christ strengthened in his soul. His words were deployed as glorious praise of the rightful Messiah. Buchwald did not mention Luther's attitude of 1523, which caused problems for the right-wing authors. <coughs> the edits of the, to the text and the highlighting of certain passages reveal the intention behind the publication. Seeking to emphasize Luther's interest in establishing 
Jewish messianic, uh, Jesus' messianic status and his dismay of God's continuing wrath of the Jews, Buchwald presents Luther as encouraging Christians to trust Jesus as a Christ. He also highlighted Luther's recommendations to the authorities and his accusation of usury. Far from playing down Luther's uh, anti-Semitism, Buchwald was concerned to relate it to his underlying theological concerns and thereby detach the reformer from the orbit of the far right. There is a long list of anti-Semitic primary feature selections of On the Jews and Their Lies, published in the Third Reich. Perhaps the most famous is that of Sasse, the Bishop of Thuringia, uh, published a few days after the Reichskristallnacht of November 1938, in an attempt to provide a Lutheran justification of the action. Indeed, German Christians and right-wing authors repeatedly sought to use Luther's prestige as the greatest German and his anti-Semitic remarks to justify the racial policies of the Third Reich. Attempts uh, such <clears throat> as that made by Buchwald to explain Luther's position as a corollary of his theology and thereby save him from the clutches of Nazism faded from the discourse. In the years before 1938, Luther's call to burn synagogues assumed a central position in the attempted National Socialist Co-option of Luther. In views of the absence of any organized <coughs> fire brigade in the 16th century, such a call was simply crazy. Nevertheless, the power of his rhetoric captured the imagination of the late 19th and early 20th century, which failed to differentiate either between the early and late Luther or the context of his statements and accorded the sentiments expressed in On the Jews with a thousand approaching canonical status. Although, more than, uh, more, uh, although only one amongst many, Luther's voice became the dominant theological voice on matters pertaining to the Church and Judaism. No one of any moral standing can accept, let alone endorse, the sentiments expressed in Luther's black writings on the Jews. Their impact on the anti-Semitic literature of the late 19th and early 20th century was fatal, and almost much of this case was misrepresented, and although much of this uh, of his uh, case was misrepresented, the, this influence was possible only because um, of that he wrote. Moreover, it was the level of authority which late 19th century Germany invested Martin Luther that <coughs> made it attractive for 20th century anti-Semites to make him the ideal intellectual figurehead of their cause. Nevertheless, we cannot ignore the fact that Luther has been subject to a certain level of misrepresentation. <clears throat> Tearing isolated passages from their textual setting and highlighting individual sentences in bold obscures any understanding of his actual intention and motivation. Raising him as their totem, the Frankish racists ignored Luther's careful translation of the Old Testament and his respect for it as God's word in pointing to the messiah, messianic status of Jesus. Yet it was his concern for this book and its claims which provided the context for all of his writings on the Jews. Viewing Luther through this theological perspective brings us to his central irresponsibility. Advancing the concept of an established 
and immutable core nature of Jewishness, of Jewishness was not only theologically dubious, but simultaneously highly attractive for late 19th century anti-Semitism. It enabled them to find value in a theologian whose central concerns were more or less irrelevant to their cause. The fight against justification by works, the Old Testament witness to Christ, and the uniqueness of salvation in the incarnate God, Jesus Christ. Luther's anti-Jewish texts were evil, but they have also been misunderstood. The wide circulation of On the Jews and Their Lies makes the connection between the list of measures which Luther articulated in it and the events of Reichskristallnacht on the 9th of November 1938, today, 79 years ago, irrefutable. Martin Luther's influence and anti-Semitism enabled all other German anti-Semites to act with a clear conscience and make Lutheran Christians susceptible, susceptible to his evil ideology. Nevertheless, to reduce Martin Luther to the status of an anti-Semite would be to grant the racists and national socialists a late triumph. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>
we shouldn't take Streicher at his word. That is to say that when you look, as you have done, at the, the hundreds of thousands of reprints of von der Mühlen on the Jews and their lies in the late 1930s in Germany, um, that these were, that there is no question that the measures that Luther there um, puts forward as, as you call it in your book, in between parentheses, mm -hmm. uh, in between quotation marks, Luther's uh, final solution for the Jewish question um, uh, <laughs> are, are, sh are, are, are spine chilling. Nonetheless, um, obviously, this is a book of almost 300 pages. And the pamphlets which were distributed throughout the 1930s were not pamphlets of 300 pages. No, no. The vast, vast sections of Luther's on the Jews and their lives were ignored. So that in, in that moment of, um, of Luther reception in the 1930s and 40s, there is an immense blind spot. And that blind spot, namely the, what you call the, the exegetical or theological perspective, um, is really at the center of... Uh, of one of the main questions you seek to answer in your book. And the main question, as I, uh, as I understand it, really is the question between these two bookends of, of, his, of his thought on this question, namely this text of 1523, um, that Jesus Christ is a born Jew, which really is it's an extraordinary document for toleration. And it is one of the most, it comes out of Wolfgang's um, I mean, sorry, Luther's support for Wolfling, it comes out of his early Hebrew studies, it comes out of his humanist education, um, and it comes out of a, kind of a reaction against the world with which he has just broken, so to speak. Um, and uh, 20 years later, one of the most venomous texts ever written about Jews in the history of um, of the West. So the question is puzzled. How do we get from 1523 to 1543? How do we get from this extraordinary call for toleration to this call for the burning of synagogues and the, for, and the prohibition of Jewish worship on pain of death, etc., etc.? And, one, and one, way, um, one way to answer that question is to say um, there is there is a, a widespread uh, tradition of, of theological anti-Judaism. Um, and um, Luther never promoted, even at the end of his life, a kind of racially pure Germany. What he promoted was a, was a theologically uh, homogenous uh, Germany in which there would be no dissent. And so, that is one answer. What that answer does is it, is it tells you that there is a, that, that, the, that the central aspect of um, of the work is is the, or the motive, the drive is theological. What it doesn't tell you is why Luther is, is is where the venom comes from. It tells you why he thinks that um, that you can't trust converted Jews. Um, it tells you why why he thinks that you, that that insofar as Jewish readings of um, of the Hebrew Bible uh, will reject Christian interpretation, um, there there is no point to a religious perspective. And you show how he comes how there are moments in his life when he actually has real encounters with contemporary Jews which are disappointing to him, and that the disappointment plays into a lot of his abandonment of that early hope that a, that a gentle and kind approach will. Will um, will lead to um, to to the conversion of, of of Jews. What it what it doesn't tell you is the venom and the violence. And I think if you you've showed us, I mean, you, you've you've spoken this evening so clearly about about that theological perspective and how that plays into the shift from the early Luther to the late Luther. Could you tell us a bit about where that? Where that violence comes from. What I mean to say is that we made a mistake in, in calling this evening Luther and the Jews. In your introduction, you say, you tell us exactly why you didn't title your book Luther and the Jews, but rather Luther's Jews. I mean, Luther's mm -hmm. Jews are not the objective Jews, but rather mm -hmm. partially 
an effect of his experience with, 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 with Jews in Germany, partly an effect of his reading of Christian Hebraic literature, and partly a figment of his imagination, part of, of, of David Nierenberg's anti-Judaism, the Jew as part of the, the non-Christian, the non-pious, the non-theologically sound. Um, the reason in which I think we're justified in speaking of Luther's anti-Semitism rather than anti-Judaism, even though it is a begrifflich an anachronism, mm -hmm. is precisely that, that there is this, this inescapable Jewishness which is not theological. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard, it's hard to understand where, where that is into the story. Um, can you just t tell us a few words about, yeah. about, about that? I mean, <laughs> good place to start. Yeah. In, in some way, I think it is, of course, a, a question of psychology as well. And I'm not really, uh, uh, I do not think anybody is able to reconstruct, so to say, Luther's uh, psychological disposition, uh, which is a quite complicated thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, first of all, I would say, uh, at the end of his track from 1523, he's making a really strange remark, saying, let's do so, let's tolerate the Jews, till I will see what I've, what I've reached, and how it's going. And I think it is, I interpret this formula as a kind of, um, uh, yeah, restriction of himself, he will, he is not really, uh, he, he does not really open the floor for a, so to say, a permanent uh, coexistence of Jewish people in, within Christian society. He is open up, uh, he's opening a situation and he will see if it works. Um, so it's a kind of uh, cocktail. Uh, and uh, the, the second thing is, um, there's a letter written by Luther to Justus Jonas, who is, so to say, the person in the ensemble of uh, uh, the Wittenberg theologians, who is uh, mostly interested in uh, Jewish questions and in the conversion of Jews. And as far as I see, he's writing, uh, uh, I'm stopping now, uh, our uh, uh, joint way uh, in dealing with the Jewish questions and I'm following my own path. Uh, and uh, so I think uh, it's a kind of, uh, he, he is convinced that it was a failure to be tolerant towards the Jews. And he is convinced that he has to be aware of the divine judgment uh, because of he is responsible for, so to say, the, the blame of Christians, uh, which is, so to say, that what the Jews in his mind always do. Uh, I think this is, so to say, uh, the, the setting in a certain <coughs> sense. And um, of course in the early 20s there is a <coughs> situation and Luther believes in this period that uh, the end of time is quite near. Uh, and he is convinced that people of different religious convictions may survive. And he is, of course, against the burning of heretics. Uh, uh, and he argues again. Uh, but the things begin to change in the 1530s quite dramatically and of course even in Protestant uh, territorial states um, uh, Anabaptists have been not only expelled but in some cases even executed. Mm -hmm. This is of course uh, not comparable to what he said in the early 1520s. So there's a dramatic change which has to do so to say, with the establishment of uh, a Protestant <coughs> church, a territorial state church, 
and Luther uh, is unwilling to believe that it might work that people of a different creed could exist within, so to say, uh, the same uh, political uh, environment. There are some voices we have in the early 16th century who say, okay, it works, look at what's going on in Bohemia. There can exist people of different creeds within, so to say, the same society, but Luther is unable to accept this. And, of course, he quotes the Ancient Testament uh, to say, uh, uh, the unbelievers have to be expelled. He argues uh, with uh, the fifth book of Moses in, uh, to say, just to prove this. Uh, yeah, this is not an answer I can give you, but uh, uh, and I do not want to uh, psychologize too much, uh, but I think the situation really has changed. The heretic, the expelled uh, 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 person uh, who has been uh, driven out by uh, the Roman church, began to be a church father himself. And he tries to care for so to say, the establishment of, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of prolongation uh, of measures uh, uh, he formally uh, has, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, rejected. Thank you. Um, so you, your book is not uh, a big book um, in terms of pages, uh, less than less than 180 of, of, of text. But it is a it is a very important book, I think, in in it's many. The, the footnote. Yeah. Um, uh, it's really extraordinary. Almost all the footnotes are to the primary Weimar Ausgabe, are to are to actual passages in the in the massive oeuvre of Luther himself. Um, uh, so, of course, it's an important work in Luther Forschung, in the history of, um, of, his, uh, of his reception and in the history of his own intellectual uh, biography. Um, it's also an important book, I think, in the history of, um, in Jewish history, firstly because you, you really collected all the evidence we have about Luther's kind of interaction with actual Jews. Um, and his remarks on those interactions from the Tisha Day and even reconstructions of, of correspondence in which that, that would have been discussed, which, which have not survived. Um, but I think what's also interesting is that you, uh, particularly towards the end, reflect on the history of Jewish historians writing about Luther. Um, and you quote uh, Heinrich Gretz at some length. Um, and you show how Gretz, even in the, in the 19th century, so before, I mean, we're talking about 1880s, um, mm -hmm. perhaps a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. So before the, uh, the before the date when you identify the kind of the confluence of of modern anti-Semitism with Luther reception, Gretz already says the difference is not that Luther was particularly more hateful of Jews than any of his contemporaries. Eck and mentions a number of them. The difference is that Luther became Luther. Luther became this oracle, Luther became larger than life. Luther became, in Lutheranism, um, uh, as, um, as Dick Verston has put it beautifully, the, the, the perennial contemporary. Always, always uh, relevant, always, um, uh, as if, and, and for that oracular, for the, the reason of that oracular, oracularity, um, those texts, were considered no less oracular than anything else. Mm. Uh, I think also unexpectedly, it is an important book in, in the history of the book. And <laughs> since since the publication of your Luther's Juden, you've given particular interest in uh, the, the dynamic between what you call the Buchdruck der Reformation and the Reformation der Buchdruck. So the impact of the printing press on the Reformation and and, and vice versa. And of course, this is 
This is where the history of Lutheranism meets Antwerp, because as all of you know, uh, Antwerp was one of the most important centers of the early uh, reading of Luther, following of Luther, printing of Luther, uh, and so the kind of the confluence of Buchgeschiedenis and Staatsgeschiedenis and the history of, of, of Lutheranism is, is particularly, uh, I think, compelling to, to all of you. Um, and one of the things I think you show beautifully is that Luther not only thought in terms of his intended readership uh, and constructed his books um, accordingly, in the case of on the, on the Jews and their lives, you show how he started submitting uh, parts of the book before it was finished to the printing press. And, and so part, part of what accounts, for example, for repetitions, for other aspects of the text, are the fact that it was, it was being printed before it was finished. And so for, especially for the students among you who are studying uh, book history, uh, this is an unexpected gem for your, for your research as well. Uh, my question is about yet, yet another an additional aspect of our understanding of early modern <coughs> intellectual culture uh, to which this book contributes, which is that of you know, humanist, humanist scholarship, humanist biblical scholarship, mm. and in particular uh, what many scholars have called for the past century or so Christian Hebraism, but which we're really learning to understand as, as a much wider and, 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 and um, uh, multilingual phenomenon, not just this Christian study of Hebrew, but also stuff of other, Jew other Jewish languages. Um, in, they discovered that Greek is a Jewish language, not just in Josephus um, or the Septuagint, but also in the Gospels. Um, the New Testament Greek reflects a certain kind of particular Palestinian Greek filled with, uh, with Hebraisms and Aramaisms. Um, one thing which I think, another blind spot that the history of, particularly the anti-Semitic reception of Luther, uh, leaves us with is that Luther is in fact a Hebraist himself. Luther is, insofar as his Old Testament is translated from the Hebrew, and we know it is because uh, of many reasons. Among them, Luther's hunt exemplar of the Hebrew Bible, a beautiful Soncino edition, a Hebrew incunable, uh, printed um, by Gershom Soncino um, in 1494, is in the Staatsbibliothek in Berlin. And it's beautifully digitized, by the way. So if you want to leaf through Luther's own Hebrew Bible, you can go to the website of the Stabi and, and look at it in incredible detail um, and, and fine-grained illumination. Luther is, among other things then, the author of one of the great <laughs> translations of Hebrew in the history of Western literature. Luther's Old Testament mm -hmm. is a masterpiece of Hebrew translation. Um, one of the things you show us, I think, also is, um, uh, is that we should start to think about Luther uh, you know, we should, we should re reevaluate the humanist in him. Um, we know, of course, that he wasn't born Luther, but Luther, and changed his name to match the Greek Eleutheria, the way his uh, friend Schwarzer changes his name to, to Melanchthon on Bergman's recommendation. But there's something about contemporary humanist Hebrew scholarship in particular with which I'm still puzzled, and that is the following. When the humanist movement really strikes root, and we're not only celebrating 500 years of the Reformation, we're celebrating 500 years of the foundation of the Leuven Trilingual College this year. Um, uh, when the humanist movement strikes root, the desire to go back to the sources of Christian scripture um, drive the study of Greek and Hebrew in the 1510s and 20s and 30s uh, as they established themselves across, across the continent from Wittenberg to and from Leuven to Rome. But studying Greek is not the same thing as studying Hebrew. Studying the Greek scriptures is not the same thing as studying the Hebrew scriptures. Studying the Greek scriptures means collecting and studying manuscripts of the Greek Bible, of the New Testament in particular, which have been copied in an unbroken chain of textual transmission since antiquity. There are Byzantine refugees after the fall of Constantinople who come to Italy and elsewhere in Europe and who bring their manuscripts, and you know, um, or you know, the humanists knew that there is nothing, even though the Church of the East might not be uh, entirely doctrinally sound, their manuscript, their tradition of manuscript transmission is unquestionably ancient. 
In the case of the Hebrew Bible, that's not the case. In the case of the Hebrew Bible, there is, obviously there are Hebrew manuscripts and, and Hebrew printed Bibles from the 1470s onwards. Um, uh, but the oldest known Hebrew manuscripts date from the 13th century at the time. And they have been copied just as the Greek from generation to generation, but not by Christians, but by Jews. So the textual tradition of the Hebrew Bible, um, the Mas Masova, the, 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 the tradition of, of, of copying is Jewish. And so one of the great kind of problematics at the heart of biblical humanism in the Christian world, be it Catholic or uh, or Lutheran or Reformed in the 16th century, is can we trust the Hebrew Bible as the Jews have transmitted it? When there's a discrepancy between the Septuagint and the Hebrew Bible, do we follow, do we follow the Hebrew Bible because it is the Urtext? Or do we follow the Septuagint because it is a translation of the Hebrew original, which is 1,700 years older than our own day, and at least 1,500 years older than the oldest Hebrew manuscript that we have? In other words, are the Jews to be trusted as transmitters of the scriptures? Now, there's a, new, there's a remarkable passage at the end of, towards the end of your book, where you quote Luther saying, I don't need the rabbis, I have the plain text. Um, and this is, of course, this is a, 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 a commonplace. Um, um, and his, his right hand, his assistant in Hebrew, Johannes Forster, writes a famous dictionary. Uh, in which he, uh, a, a Hebrew Latin dictionary in which he lists only Hebrew words which occur in the Hebrew Bible and not a single, a single Hebrew word which is rabbinic, as he calls them, post biblical, um, Mishnaic, or from any of the, of the commentaries. Um, and he says so on the title page, it's a beautiful copy in the Plantin Moretis Library. Um, so, this idea that you can separate the Hebrew Bible from the Jews. <laughs> runs throughout your book, runs throughout your book, throughout your argument for his theological perspective, the Jews don't understand their own text, um, which is part of, part of the, great, the great problem. But what Luther never says, or, I mean, I haven't gone through the entire Weimar Ausgabe, what I don't think, what I haven't found Luther saying, is that the, is that the plain text, I, I don't need the rabbis because I have the plain text, I don't find him saying, the pl I have the plain text, because the Jews are trustworthy trans transmitters. Mm -hmm. So there's this blind spot in Luther's Old Testament vision shaft, if we can call it that. Mm -hmm. He takes for granted, or he doesn't address, or at least he doesn't problematize or mention explicitly the fact that the Hebrew Bible, which is for him enough, he only has because for 1500 years since Christianity, the Jews have copied it trustworthily. And the reason that it can be trusted is because we have the Hilchot, we have the laws that make the copying, that, that govern the kosher copying of a Hebrew Bible. And because the Jews adhere to the law of copying the Hebrew Bible independently, we can trust their scripture. And this becomes a massive debate, of course, in the second half of the 16th century, um, when, the very, when, the, you know, when the question of the, the antiquity of the vowel points, and, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, becomes one of the central kind of problems in, uh, in confessional biblical scholarship among or between Reformed and Lutheran uh, theologians. But Luther, my question then, to put it uh, in, in as, as, as succinctly as I can, is twofold. One, does Luther ever, have you ever found him saying the plain text that I have, that I translate, and which is enough for me, only have, I only have because the Jews have copied it for 15 centuries in a, in a, in a trustworthy manner. In other words, and insofar as that text is essential to the, the Reformation I want to accomplish, 1,500 years of post-Christian Jewish scribal copying is necessary for Christian truth. So that's, the, that's, the, that's the implication. <laughs> This is really a wonderful point. <laughs> and of course, I do not know any reflection uh, uh, that Luther uh, gives, so to say, on the way the Hebrew text has been transmitted. 
he does not really, as far as I see, he does not really reflect on it. And if he did, or if he would have done, he would simply say, God has preserved the manuscript. <laughs> so that the Jews could have done something good uh, for his reformation, he would not uh, accept. Yeah? This has to do with his ignorance uh, concerning the central historical issue. Um, another thing I would mention is, or I'd like to mention is, that Luther even uh, in, in his uh, terrible catalogue of measures what has to be done against the Jews, he uh, also mentions the uh, destruction um, um, of uh, not only Jewish manuscripts, but even of uh, uh, the, uh, the manuscript of the um, uh, Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. It also has to be taken away from the Jews because they don't understand it right. Yeah, they have to read Luther's translation. <laughs> uh, and that would help them to understand what's going on. They are simply unable to understand what's given uh, in the text. This is his conviction. And of course, this is not, uh, uh, th this is really extremely far from any, so to say, scientifically disputable position because he argues terribly often against uh, rabbinic uh, exegesis and he, I think the only thing he knows about it has been driven from Christian interpreters of rabbinic material. In his time it is Sebastian Münster and of course there are some medieval authors who know something about rabbinic uh, uh, commentators and pick up the one and uh, uh, one or the other things, uh, but he has no original access uh, to Jewish uh, Bible interpretation, and of course he do not have any interest to do so. This is, uh, this is really uh, a clear limit of his, uh, so to say, intellectual uh, yeah, or to say curiosity or whatever, there are of course uh, Christian Hebrews and that would be my argument against your idea to uh, make Luther a Christian Hebrewist. I think he wasn't. Uh, of course he, he, he was working with, uh, with uh, materials, he was working with uh, things that could be helpful, with dictionaries and so on. He was asking people what could this uh, uh, Hebrew term mean? But he was not really interested in, uh, so to say, intellectually or scientifically interested uh, in what could be the original sense. So there are clear limits, and I would uh, uh, see uh, <coughs> quite different approaches in the camp of the humanists who were, of course, even interested in uh, uh, Hebrew sources, uh, rabbinic sources, uh, 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 which had no relation or no direct relation to biblical texts. And Luther was, of course, fed up with uh, Reuchlin's attempt to reconstruct the Kabbalah, as far as we see now in uh, Wittenberg, uh, Luther's near colleague, Andreas Bodenstein, um, the chief editor of a uh, scientific uh, uh, edition of uh, Andreas Rudolf Bodenstein von Karlstadt's work, who was a colleague and later on a concurrent of uh, Luther uh, in uh, early Wittenbergian theology. And there are some hints that uh, Karlstadt understood himself as a kind of Kabbalist. He was a Reuchlinist, he was, uh, he was following this path, and Luther was uh, not interested in this at all. Mm. He was uh, he was uh, quite uh, quite angry because this does not lead, so to say, to the uh, messianic uh, topoys uh, he was looking for. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we have we have heard a uh, a master historian speak to us 
this evening, uh, we've learned um, that to study history is to study historiography, that to study historiography is not just to learn what historians saw and how they saw it, but what they didn't see, <laughs> and what others didn't see, what they um, didn't, see, didn't see accurately, um, or what they did see and put to non-historical or historiographical use. Um, I think uh, we've been fortunate to hear um, precisely uh, what it is to think about this tradition um, and this set of, of, of issues from, from a panoramic point of view that takes in both, both the Nachlas and, and the source itself. I don't want to have the final word, I'd like to give the final word to Professor Kaufman, but um, I'll do it by just reading to you just, just one, one paragraph from his book. Um, what is evident is that Protestant theologians with Nazi sympathies or lay people with Lutheran background were not only among those who made the reformer out to be complicit in the most gruesome crimes in human history, but were primarily responsible for doing so. Admittedly, the really tragic aspect of this is precisely that Luther's own writings, his repentant, hate-filled tirades against the Jews made the task easy. Luther is no more simple victim of this process than that he deserved to be in the dock at Nuremberg. Luther's fear and hatred of the Jews were of their time, but the fact that this circumstance has not proved a barrier to their being taken up in the 20th century is fundamentally linked to the deeply rooted tendency in Protestant history to monumentalize Luther the Reformer and to appropriate his theology and quote it as being always timely and adaptable to the current situation. The only way forward is to accept the truth, no doubt painful to some, but theologically inescapable, that we can no more put our faith blindly in Luther's theology than responsible 21st century adults would voluntarily place themselves in the hands of a 16th century surgeon. <laughs> Join me in thanking Professor.